Hey, good morning, guys. If you have your Bibles, I uh, hope that you do go ahead and turn in them to John chapter 2, uh, the Gospel of John chapter 2, will be in verses 1 through 11. And while you're finding that, I need to make an announcement before I forget because I'm going to. Um, uh, May 27 and 28, um, men, we are going to be going to Lake James fishing, okay, uh, for a camping trip with you and your sons and daughters. Um, if you uh, are interested in that, we're going to start having signups next week. What we'll do is we'll leave on, for, or you'll come up there on Friday, and it's a boat access only camping trip. So um, for those of you who are in the room and you own boats, please come see me because I'd like to have you be a, be a taxi or to help out with that. But um, uh, we're going to get up on Friday and we can taxi you over to your campsite, do some fishing uh, Friday night, and then Saturday morning we'll fish um, up until around lunchtime or something like that. So just wanted to put that on your radar and be thinking about that. And again, if you're uh, wanting to help with that in any way or if you have a boat particularly, uh, just come see me afterwards and uh, we'll get that squared away and get you, get you helping with that. Okay, that's May 27 and 28. Sound good, Scott? Got your rod? Good, good. All righty. Hey, um, uh, John chapter 2, 1 through 11. Look, I, I always ask this just because it's, 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 it's just something that's in my heart. If you're physically able, please, I want, to, I want us to stand while we read God's Word together. Uh, it's just something that's, um, I think, this Bible, and I always do. And So, uh, beginning in verse 1, on the third day, there was a wedding in Canaan, Galilee. The mother of Jesus was there, and Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars that were there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, Now, draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And so they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now that had become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants um, who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you... You have kept the good wine until last. This is the first of the signs that Jesus did in Canaan and Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Let's pray together. Father God, I pray for, Lord, I pray for prayer. <laughs> I pray, God, that today we would, A, that we would see ourselves empty that we just we we are we are out of wine, we're out of joy. God, um, whether whatever aspect of our life that we're in, Lord, and that we are we would admit that we are empty and we are in need of you to fill us, to give us joy, to bring back joy. God, I pray that we would go to you as the source of that, Lord, and that you would fill us with love. For you, Lord, and for others. God, I pray for sweet moments. From today and then afterwards, God, of just us spending time with you. Praying. As tough as it is, God, and as difficult as it may be right now. Or in other times of our life, God, but you would just, you would bless us with your presence. Can't wait to see what's going to happen from it, God, because I know that there is just crazy power in our lives and in this world when, when we pray. We love you, Lord, and we can't wait to see what you're going to do. So we pray this one with one eye open, waiting to see. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can have a seat. If you, uh, I've been doing a lot of weddings lately. I think last time I preached here, I talked about that a little bit, but I have, and it's just on my mind because it's just so many. I, have, I think I have seven weddings to do between now and, and the 1st of October, so I'm doing like tons of premarital counseling, 
and sitting down with guys and then doing tons of wedding sermons. And the sermon today, I have never preached, except for the first service this morning, never preached before a church. I've always done it at weddings because it's fitting. There's a wedding in Cana. There's a wedding that's going on. Seems like a pretty good text for that, Scott. So that's what I'm going to do. Scott, I'm all over you. It's good to see you, by the way, man. Yes. Anyway, I'll pick on somebody else over here. Um, everybody over here is like put their head down as soon as I said that, like, oh, my goodness. But, uh, yeah, so I've been doing a lot of work, and this has been on my heart. Um, and, 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 you know, uh, what I do with the couples and what I talk to them about is the A, uh, you know, looking at this, Jesus was invited to this wedding. That's a big deal. You know, that Jesus was liked enough that he got an invitation. His disciples were like them, that he got an invitation, and he came. But here's the thing, is that too often in our lives and in our marriages and in our churches, Um, And in our relationship with God, Jesus is just invited at the beginning. You know, we just want him there for the ceremony of the sermon. We don't really get into, there's a life that we're going to live with him. There's, there's going to be some stuff that happens after the wedding day. And so I always encourage these couples that look guys, you know, inviting to the wedding, but look, inviting to the marriage. Let him be there forever because this is going to last. Salvation, guys, our salvation is the mark of the beginning of a great and wonderful, eternal, everlasting relationship that we're going to have with God, right, instead of the finality of it. If you ever heard one, uh, J.D. Greer says that the gospel is not the diving board. The gospel is the pool. Okay, but too often we've kind of reversed that in Christian and in the church. This is, man, this is about a life with God. So just inviting him into our lives, and I hope that you have, and if you haven't, I invite you to do that today. I pray that the Holy Spirit invites you to a saving, wonderful relationship with God, and that that would begin today. But there's going to be so much more to it. And let me tell you something, guys, relationships are tough. Relationships are full of rocky roads and roadblocks and all sorts of things in, 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 in our individual lives, and it's certainly true with a life with God. Guys, the wine's going to run out. And that's the next thing I always share with the couples is at some point the wine's going to run out. You know, the love tank's not going to be filled all the time. And that's true in our relationship with God. Guys, there's sometimes the provisions are going to run out. There are times when the passion is going to run out. Whether that's in a marriage or, again, with our relationship with God or a relationship with the church or relationships with friends, there's times the passion, the feelings that we have at the moment, they're going to run out. And sometimes the patience with people, it's going to run out. And the same, again, is true with our relationship. David, the great psalmist, the king of Israel, wrote in Psalm 51, Restore to me the joy of my salvation. You know why he wrote that? Because it had ran out. He needed it restored. Have you ever had, or are you living in now, the the joy? Guys, in the Bible, wine is a representation of joy a lot of times, and the joy that is supposed to be in our hearts by God. And David says that some of his joy, it's gone, and it needs to be restored. So this is what I want us to do today. I want us to look at some ways that when the wine runs out, we can be restored. Okay, so we want to look at What we need for that. A, we need good friends who know Jesus. Second thing we need, B, is we need friends who will pray for us. And we need to go to Jesus in private prayer ourselves. So let's look at these first. Okay, when things run out, we need friends who know Jesus. Mary knew Jesus, don't you think? She probably knew Jesus better than anyone that was there, right? G- Mary, if there's anyone who knows who Jesus is, it's Mary. She's got a pretty good background to know that he's God in flesh, for sure. So look, Mary knows him, and she knows what Jesus is capable of. She knows the compassion that he has for others. So she knows when this happens at this wedding that she needs to go to him. And you need, I need, we need people in our lives that know Jesus. That's who we should go to when things run out. Why don't we do that? Why do I have to preach that? We don't. We go to everything else and everyone else on the planet to find out instead of going to people who really know and love Jesus. One of my elders, um, I'm going through the Old Testament with two of our elders, and we have a little comment section in our Bible study every day. And one of our elders said this this morning, and it said, or he said, I am so glad sources of of, of advice are so important to me and 
Seeking out godly counsel is what I must seek after. I always tell people, you need to know the source of your sources. <laughs> you know, it would be nice to know who the source of the source you're going to is. Who is it that they're getting information from? And Mary certainly knew Jesus, and that's who we need. Do you, let me ask, do you have anyone in your life that's like that? People that you just know, know Jesus. You know, people that you just know, she's probably talked to Jesus this morning. People that you just know, he really knows his Bible. He really knows God well. That's the person that I'm going to go to when things run out in my life. You know, I hope you have someone like that in your life. If you don't, guys, this is the wonder and the beauty and the glory of the church is that God has given us the ability to have good Christian friends that we can seek out when things run out and go to. My mother has always been my source for this. She's always the person that I know. She just knows Jesus. I know that she's praying. My mother, when she was 15, her, her, her mom died of cancer. And when she was 16, her dad accidentally got shot and killed. And she just lived this life with God after such tragedy and everything. I remember my mother telling us the story about when the moment she realized right before the funeral that she was an orphan. And she was sitting out on this little rock wall at the house and she said she just cried out to God. And she says, God, I'm an orphan. And she said in an audible voice, he spoke and says, Diane, I'll take care of you for the rest of your life. I'm going to tell you, that's the kind of person that I like to go to. You know, that I know that she has walked with and talked with Jesus, and I know that she's been in her word and knows her word. She's a go-to for me. Do you have anyone like that in your life? If not, please seek people out that you know know Jesus. They know what he's capable of. They know that he cares for you. Seek those people out. Next thing we need to do when we run into problems and when things just run out in our lives is we need to find friends who will pray for us. That'll pray for us. They know Jesus and they'll actually go to Jesus in prayer out of genuine concern for you. Because I'm going to tell you, it's easy to kind of, I'm just going to talk about my wicked heart here a little bit and let you know how you might leave before the sermon's over and think that dude is really, really bad. But you ever hear of bad news of somebody else and you can't help but just get a little bit of, ha ha, they deserve that, Right? You know, you're not genuinely concerned. You hear this thing and there, there is some, you have this pleasure in someone else's misfortune. You know, you just kind of share a little bit. I'm going to be, it's crazy. My Duke fans will probably leave on me. But I'm a big Carolina fan, okay? Just, I was waiting for an amen on that one. I'm a, I'm a Tar Heel fan, but once a year, this is awful of me. But um, uh, when I, I taught high school, okay, in one of my slides, it was when J.J. Reddick got beat in the home, his last home game, they took a picture of this little boy. It was a little boy. And he had a Duke shirt on and he's got tears running down his face. And that was my slide. When I taught school, like every other slide was this kid. All my Duke fans were in. But I, I had joy in that. It was just joy for me seeing this kid cry. And then this year when Coach K lost his last home game to Carolina, we needed applause for that? Okay, I didn't get applause for that. First. But when they beat them, I was like legitimately in front of the TV going, ha ha, you got beat. That's awful of me to share in someone else's misfortune. But look, here's what happened. Mary, <laughs> Mary was genuinely concerned that this happened. She could have done this. Ha ha, they ran out of wine. How embarrassing. This is going to be great. You know, what shame for this family. I didn't like them anyway. I wasn't going to come, but I'm glad I came now because this is happening. You know, but that happens in our lives. I don't know. And often, and awful, this is awful, but it happens in here. It happens in the church. It happens in small groups. It used to happen in Sunday school all the time when I was, in, when I was a kid. But here's what happens. You hear of something and you go, did you hear what happened to them? And you're just this much tickled. You know, and then you talk about it, which becomes gossip for like the next 15 minutes. And then you, you put at the end of it, but we need to pray for them. You know, it's masked in some kind of prayer concern. And you're not concerned at all. We can't have that, guys. You need to have, we need to have, I need to have people that are genuinely concerned for us and that will pray for us, not talk about us. Okay, we, guys, and look, we need coaches in life, not umpires. Okay, people who can give us, look, um, over the years I was a high school baseball coach for about 10 years and then also just watched baseball my whole life. And a few years back I was uh, watching this guy coach um, 
And this was his, this was his coaching. That ball was high. Why are you swinging at it? <laughs> you know? Why'd you miss that ball, boy? Come on. You know? Or just shouting out the obvious. Everybody knows the ball was high. My wife, who thinks runs or touchdowns, knew the ball was high. Okay? This is, everybody knew that. Why would you shout the obvious, right? Why would you shout what they did wrong? Why don't you shout some instruction, coach? Why don't you tell them what to do right? I love instructional coaches, people who tell you, right? Look, we live in a world where there's a lot of people that are just umpires instead of coaches. They can come to us and say, look, instead of having, look, instead of people who point fingers, we need people who pray for us. We need divine advice, not blame assignment. We need faith seekers and not fault finders. We need someone who will inquire of the Lord instead of put us through an inquisition. I'm going to tell you, it's, it's a big difference when someone sits down and when you're honest with them, and instead of them making a big deal, they just honestly sit down and they're genuinely concerned and they pray. Can this be us, Hope? Can this be us? Can we be people like that? We're genuinely concerned for those around us. We're genuinely concerned for those people who struggle at our, that are around us and that struggle. And we're not just mean about it. That we're genuinely concerned and we just say, look, I love you and Jesus loves you and I know what he's capable of and I know he's compassionate. And I'm going to go pray for him, for you. Can we be this? People who know Jesus and people who pray to him instead of spitting off our advice, instead of just being people who make accusations and pointing out all that's wrong, people who can point to Jesus for people. Can we be that as a church? Oh, glorious, wouldn't it be for the Lord Jesus, for his church to be that? I pray that that's how I am in my life. And look, guys, because look, the wine is going to run out. And when the wine runs out, the last thing we need here is that we need to go to Jesus in private, personal prayer. It's good to have people praying for us, especially those who know Jesus. But it's another thing for us to go to him in prayer. Look, when things get difficult in our life, when things get difficult in our relationship with God, we need to go to him to be filled with it. Look, when I cover this in weddings and when I'm doing this with premarital counseling generally, here's what I do. I ask them, tell me about falling in love, right? And they all tell me these love, you know, no, I saw them and it's just this and that. I hear all these love stories and it's wonderful. And here's what I do. I say, look, who do you think, where do you think that love came from? The Bible teaches us that God is, fill it in, he is love. It's not that God has a little bit. It's not that he borrowed some. It's not that he knows where to get some. The Bible says that what? God is love. So if he gave you that for one another, praise God for that, right? And if you leave him, the love will start to fade. A lot of times, guys, in crisis counseling, couples come to me. Here's the first thing I do. Here's the first thing I do. If you, so if you, I'm just going to warn you. If you come to me, maybe not warn you. I don't know. Maybe encourage you. I don't know. But if you come in for crisis counseling, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to say, I'm going to eyeball the male. I'm going to eyeball the husband, and I'm going to say, hey, man, when's the last time you prayed with her? I've told this story before hundreds of times as I've preached, but this is true. First church I pastored, one of my deacons and his wife came to me, and they were in some crisis on Saturday morning, and that was the question I asked him. I said, when's the last time you prayed with her? She put her head down. And I looked over there, and I said, hey, eyeball me. And I looked back over at him, and I said, when's the last time you prayed with her? He went, oh, we pray over supper. I said, come on, man. And I asked her again, and she said, never. Never. 17 years of marriage, 17 years of marriage, he never grabbed his wife's hands, and they wondered why love was gone. Where's the source of it? God, how do we access it? Prayer. Prayer. There is something powerful that happens when we pray with each other because everything else is counterfeit, guys. If you're struggling in your relationships, if you're, if you're struggling in your relationship with God, everything else is counterfeit. You can go to all the podcasts, listen to all the podcasts you want, all the sermons you want, read all the books, go to counselors, and even this, go to Christian friends. There's got to be a time where we go ourselves to him in private prayer. And to be honest with him, because God's prayer is tough. Amen. 
That's, that's a better, bigger amen than the Carolina thing. <laughs> Prayer is tough. Prayer is a struggle. Guys, don't get me wrong. Look, prayer can be times, I've had prayer moments in my life where I just get up off the floor and there's pools of just tears of me thanking God for all these things. I can hardly get through that song, The Goodness of God. Because that, that line in there, all my life you have been faithful. When you've been through the stuff that I've been through, and you've been as mean as I've been, and you've been as big as a sinner as I've been, and you can still sing that song all my life. You've been faithful. I haven't been really faithful. I just admit it. I'm not. But to sing that he has, okay, it's, 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 it's an awesome thing. But look, the thing, prayer's tough. We can have moments in prayer where we are, man, I'm telling you, I've had mountaintop experiences. Can I say it that way, you know, where it's just like it's moments of transfiguration. Like the room starts to feel like it's white, and I'm just praying for God, okay, this is it. Take me on. Take me on. Just there's a chariot of fire going to come down here and whisk me away. Ashley and the kids will be okay. Just take me to heaven with you right now. I mean, awesome moments, but prayer can also breed times of utter darkness and loneliness and times when we feel empty and times we, 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 when we feel like it's just ran out. Where is he? Right? Where, is, where, where are you? This can happen to all of us, the best of us. Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of the greatest writers of the 20th century and pastors, wrote this. Everything we do in the Christian life is easier than prayer. Alexander White, 19th century um, Scottish pastor, says this. There is nothing that we are so bad at all of our days as prayer. Thomas Shepard, another 16th century Puritan writer and pastor, is wonderful, said, There are times in my life when I would rather die than pray. That's a pastor saying. If you read Psalm 42, I was going to excerpt it in here today, so don't be trying to find it. I'm sorry. But Psalm 42, he says, the writer says, who was a worship leader, says, why are you cast down within me, O my soul? You know, what, what, where are you, God's what he cries out. Charles Spurgeon, the greatest preacher, they called it, his son called him the prince of preachers, the most prolific writer in, his, in Christian history, said this, sometimes we do not receive comfort in our prayers when we are broken and cast down, that is when we really wrestle and prevail in prayer. Pray until you can pray. Great counsel here. Pray until you can pray. Pray to be helped to pray. And do not give up praying because you cannot pray. For it is when you think you cannot pray, that is when you are praying. Amen and amen from my life. That is true. Can you cry out with me and say this? Oh, blessed emptiness. Oh, blessed times of darkness. That sounds weird, doesn't it? Oh, blessed times when the wine is gone. Because those are the times blessed, blessed for who? They're blessed for God. How wonderful do you think it makes God to see you go through what you're going through, to sense the silence, to feel all of the pain, and yet you still go to him. How awesome does that make God feel? How blessed is that of God that in your times of trouble, you still have faith, you still pray. But guys, listen, this is the mark of a relationship with God. We just coming out of the book of Exodus. Guys, the Passover was awesome. The Red Sea's wonderful. The manna, would love to have some Krispy Kreme this morning myself. But if you read the story, they have to walk with God. And it is a rocky, rocky, sin-filled road. It's tough. But God's always faithful. I think that you need to hear this as a new believer. If you're a new believer in this room, the road is going to be a little tough. It's a relationship with an almighty God. It's a relationship with a perfect God. And let me tell you something. You're not almighty and you're not perfect, and nor am I. It's going to be a rocky road, walking that road. I think this is why many people walk away from the faith, is when they sense this dryness. They feel this joy is gone from their salvation, and they think it's something that they did, or they think that this God didn't really care in the first place. But this is the th look, this is when we dig in. This is when we realize, like the man who brought his son to Jesus who was struggling and he said to Jesus, I believe, but help my unbelief. Have you ever prayed that? 
Oh my goodness, the times in my front room where I've cried out, God, help my unbelief. I don't believe this. This is a struggle for me. I, don't, I can't believe that you said to do this, and I can't believe that you said that, and to quit this job and to move to this, and I can't, I can't believe this. Help my unbelief. Tim Keller said, as Spurgeon says, and as I would say, pray about not wanting to pray if you can't pray for anything else. Many times I've sat in my prayer, sat in my prayer closet and said, God, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what to say. And I don't even want to sit here. I, help me. Help me today. I'll see you in a little while. Guys, it's a glorifying thing to God is when we continue in faith when the wines ran out. When we do what he said do, even when the wines ran out, it blesses him and ultimately blesses us. Here's what, the, here's what happens, guys. Our needs provide opportunities. When our wine runs out, it provides opportunities for three things. One, for us to be obedient. Two, for God to get glory. And three, for our faith to grow. Needs provide opportunities. When the wine runs out, we have a chance to see something. Like John chapter 7 here, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, verse 7 here in John chapter 2, Jesus says to the servants, I love this, fill the jars with water. Fill the jars with water. And these servants that are at this wedding, they do it. Okay, they obey it. But I've always thought this was strange. Water? Guys, wouldn't that add to their embarrassment? Wouldn't this hurt them? If you're a servant and you hear this, put water in now, come on. This is going to say that they really ran out of everything and now they're trying to trick us. This is going to add to their, their shame. I'm not putting water in those jars. But these servants do what Jesus said do as crazy and as strange as it sounds. They do it. Now, isn't that true obedience? Isn't that true obedience when God says to do something that makes no sense to you, but you do it anyway? That's obedience. Do that with my kids all the time. Why am I doing this? Because I said so, boy. <laughs> right? Because I said so, girl. That's a, what, what, explain it. No, I'm not going to explain that. Do it because I said so. Right? But guys, this is true obedience, and we get a chance to do that. When God looks at you and says, switch jobs and start that ministry for foster kids, and you do it. It doesn't make any sense. What? Do it. See what happens. When God says, take an old 1908 church and a new startup church that's working out of the Y and merge them together and see what happens. And we're standing in that room right now. Strange, weird things that he says do. And we do them anyway. It's awesome. Needs provide opportunities for us to be obedient and to do anything other than what we think is right and doing what he says is right. These opportunities or for his glory too. I love this. John chapter, uh, or verse 11 here. This, the first of his signs. If you're familiar with the gospel of John, everything has double meaning in the gospel of John. There's two meanings to everything. Okay, you got to see it from that light. But these are signs. These are things pointing to who Jesus is. The first of his signs, Jesus did at Canaan and Galilee and did what? And manifested his glory. This is for his glory. These opportun- I mean, these needs are for his glory. These times when I'm sitting in prayer and I don't feel it, these times when I'm sitting in service and I just can't wait till 12, right? These times when I'm doing this ministry and I can't find anything, these are times for him to bring glory to himself. These are signs. This water in the wine was more than pointing to something just for this party. Guys, Jesus was more than an invited guest at a couple's wedding back then, Right? Jesus is doing more than saving a couple from some social shame. Jesus is doing more than keeping the source of joy, the wine, going so this party can keep doing, going. He's doing so much more. This is a sign. Jesus is letting us know he is the master of the ceremony. Jesus doesn't need to be invited into your life for one day. Jesus needs to be your life for all your days. That sounded good. I just, yeah, that wasn't on my notes. That was, record that. I need to live by that one. I need to keep that one going, you know, because I don't have that on my days. What about y'all? 
But that's what he is. Jesus is something he's saying here. He is the source of joy for all of mankind. He will be the source of joy for the marriage supper of the Lamb that you and I as believers will be at for the rest of eternity. We will be in this wedding ceremony, this celebration in heaven, and he will be our source of, source of joy. We won't need wine. We might not even need food. I'll be thin again. Jesus is doing so much more here. Jesus' blood is greater than the wine of the first covenant. Here I said blood. Why did I say that? Jesus, when his mother said, this is, this is the problem, they don't have any wine. And Jesus said, my hour has not yet come. His hour is a reference to his death. Always in John. His hour means the time of his death. So his death is going to produce a blood that will be greater than the new covenant sacrifices of the blood of animals. Jesus is doing so much more here in this. God has truly saved the best for last. <laughs> the cheaper wine was the old covenant. The new and glorious joy-filled wine is the new covenant in Jesus this is a sign for us guys pointing to who Jesus truly was. The wine that is supposed to be the joy that fills our heart forever. I love this last one. Who was the sign for? The master of the ceremonies? He didn't even know about it. The bride and the groom? There's no evidence that they ever know that Jesus did anything for them. They don't know. Who's it for? It says at the very last here. And his disciples believed in him. This sign was for five dudes that he had just called. There's only five disciples with him at this point. Five men that he had brought. It's for them to look at it and go, oh, wow, this guy's a little more than just some good teacher that caught us on the Sea of Galilee. He's a little more than that, isn't he? Oh, wow. We'll keep following him for another day or so. This guy's different. Can we do that, guys? Can we be disciples? And look at the problems around us in our own lives and the problems in this world. And go to Jesus as the source of love for us and for all of the world. And just listen for what crazy thing he might tell you to do. What crazy ministry he might tell you to start. Crazy thing that he might tell you just to go across the hall and knock on the door to your son. And say, hey, boy, I need to pray with you. Or to your daughter. Or in the bed beside of you to grab your wife and say, hey, can we pray? Or to go across the hall in the dorm room and say, hey, can I, can I pray with you? This might sound crazy, but God told me that I need to pray with you. Can we be obedient to that? Here's what I think. As being a follower of Jesus all my life, I think that this is what might happen. That once we do that, he might look over at us and just give us a little wink. I told you so. I told you to do that. No one needs to know this. I don't need to be the master of the ceremonies and stand up and say, see what I did today, everybody? I don't need to do that. It's just between me and you. You did that, Braxton? He'll give you a little wink. Thank you. Right? Could that be true? Chandler, could he give you a little wink one of these days and say, yeah, I'm moving from Asheville to Shelby to come do that college ministry at Gardner Webb? Here's what it was for. You see someone give his life to Christ or her life to Christ and baptize, and he just looks up at you and gives you a little wink. I told you. Man, that's what life's all about. His glory. Believers, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, scorning shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Is anybody in here this morning willing to admit, to be honest enough, to sit down and say, you know what, I've ran out. I'm out of wine. There's no joy in my salvation anymore. Hey, this week as your pastor, I knocked on the door of two of our staff members, people who were supposed to be under me, and said, look, can you pray with me? I'm a little low. My faith is a little thin. That sounds crazy, right? Well, we ought to fire him next week. Nah, well, no, you can't if you want to, but. Um, are you willing to admit that? You're a little low? 
Is the marriage tank a little low today? Is the relationship tanks a little low today? You just, not, you just don't have enough love in you? Oh my goodness, can I encourage you to go to the source? Go to the source. He can fill you with it. You may not feel it. We sing a song, we've sang a song over the years, Waymaker. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't what? Feel it, you're working. And to have the faith to continue to sing that. Hey, if you're a, um, hey, by the way, I'm going to give you a little hint, a little help. For, for those of you who are believers and you've walked with God and you, you, you've trusted in him, you have a relationship with him. He's been invited. Okay, but maybe it's been a while since you've prayed. Here's, I'm going to give you a, a good way to start praying. In my house 20 years ago, in the front room of my house, I set aside a place. This is where me and Jesus are going to meet. Okay, the front room on my couch, and then there's two chairs in there. One of those chairs are his. Okay, my kids can't go sit in it. That's a joke. They can go sit in it. But anyway, you sat on Jesus' lap, you know. I'm there. But there's two places, and that's where, he, that's where Jesus is. So we sit there in the mornings, and that's where we're going to talk. Okay, and we're going to have a conversation. Here's the little hint. Here's the hint. Every time I get up and leave in the morning, I'll say, I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow. And when you say that, you kind of feel like you held to it. I'm going to be open and transparent. A few years back, about six year, for, for six years, I walked by that room and I looked in there and I hadn't been in there. Six years. I'd go in there and sit and I just couldn't pray. And every time I walked by there, I would say, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. And I could hear him calling. Oh, I still prayed. I still spent some time, but not those moments of intimate love to where he could just pour himself into me because I needed it. Find you a spot like that. For the non-believer in the room, here's what I want to tell you. You've been drinking some really cheap wine. It's not the good stuff. All those things, I can tell you from experience, all those things you've been going to to give you joy. People get upset at me for crying all the time up here. I'm going to explain something. I cannot plead for your soul as if God is pleading through me and not. I can't. The things you've been going to for joy in your life that have failed miserably and you know it. It's cheap wine. God has saved the best and I pray that today is the day for it for you. He saved the best for last for you today. Give your life to him. Stop all the other things that you're going to for joy and just give your heart and your life to him. Oh my goodness. It'll be tough, but it is a life filled with it. Filled with joy that lasts forever. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes because it's the time to do that. And I just want you to do something for me. Uh, if you're in this room, please, uh, just look, here's the thing while we say bow your heads and close your eyes. If you close your eyes, it'll keep everybody from looking and stuff. And, you know, them doing what I said not do a while ago. Did you see their hand was up? I hope they don't do that. I hope that they pray for you. But look, with your eyes closed and your head bowed, just raise your hand in this room. Is anybody in here just to a point in your life where the wines ran out? I want you to raise your hand because I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. Just raise your hand up there. It's, it's out. The wine is out. And you're just feeling really empty. Whether that's with God or with any situation, just slip your hand up. And I want to pray for you. If there's anybody in this room and look, it, it, you've never given your heart to Jesus, but you want to do that right now. You need to make a decision for him. Just slip your hand up too. And I want to pray for you as well. Father God, we love you. And Lord, I pray for those hands that are up, that their hearts need filled with your love. God, I pray that they would hear from you and that their faithfulness, their willingness to still pursue you, their, their belief in the face of the dryness, God, would be so, God, that you would just fill them, Lord. I pray, Lord, for the unbelievers in this room, Lord, for those who have now committed their lives to Christ, God, that you would just bless Give them the joy of salvation, Lord, continually. Lord Jesus, I pray that we would be your church. 
that we would be friends who know Jesus, that we would be friends who go to pray and not gossip and not talk. And God, that we would be disciples who are obedient and that our belief would continue to be strong. I pray this, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen.